So what's your seed? Um, it's sort of interesting. It feels like something that other people should tell you, not that you should necessarily say to yourself. But um, um, I guess I'm an excellent communicator mm -hmm. and kind of explorer. So I explore, and then when I discover things, I'm able to communicate them to others. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. And um, you also you write a lot of books, and you what kind of explorations do you do? Uh, I've written a couple of books. One book was about psychedelic shamanism, mm -hmm. and I went through a kind of spiritual crisis and wanted to see if there was any kind of deeper meaning or truth to existence. That led me to different tribal cultures where I went through kind of you know, rituals using substances like ayahuasca and mushrooms and iboga. And um, so, yeah, so the books, the work has just generally been generated out of my own fascination, wanting to learn something, and then getting excited about communicating what I've learned. And then after the second book, which was about the prophecies of cultures like the Maya and the Hopi, I um, got interested in applying all these different ideas to society itself. So that led me to ultimately start a company called Evolver. And we have a nonprofit volunteer network of organizers who put on local events. And we do interactive teleseminars around subjects like shamanism and permaculture and activism and alternative economics. We publish books. Um, we do retreats, events, and uh, now we're starting also to sell products and goods that we feel will help people make a transformation in their lives. Cool. So what do you feel um, you learned in the explorations that um, you really want to put out there in like the rituals and in um, your journeys and with the um, with the prophecies of the Mayan and the indigenous people that you've been visiting. Like, what specifically is like some of the kernel that you would really want to get out there and share? Yeah, well, but I have been sharing it obviously a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you know, and obviously the you know the books were very long and there's a lot of different types of material, yeah. but um, mm -hmm. I guess in essence, you know, I think that we tend to have what one of these uh, North American Indian guy that we took for my film talked about as a salvation point mentality where we expect salvation to come from outside of ourselves, through some like distant authority or technology of the future or something. And that actually that's not what happens at all. It's more of a change in mindset and recognizing that we are directly participating in whatever is going to take place and therefore how we you know, use our energy and our time and our awareness and our capabilities has, uh, that, that, that is the prophecy, that is the transformation. Wow, awesome. So the transformation is individuals using their own mind to participate and how they use their thoughts and their creations? Yeah, well, I, people have to go through a process that's, you know, partially an emotional, partially intellectual process where they see that society, this civilization we're in is in a state of crisis and that it's not sustainable. And then they have to not get so emotional that they just react, but actually then step back and use their powers of observation and analysis to kind of discern why we're in this situation and then figure out how they would use their particular skills to, to help bring about a positive shift. Right. And have you been noticing a lot of this happening as you're reaching out and touching people and um, that people are going through this transformation and they are figuring out how to get beyond the crisis and learn to be sustainable? Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, it's happening on different levels of society. Thank you. And one thing that's very interesting right now is that a lot of people who are kind of part of what we might call the you know, elite, you know, social and financial and so on, are also beginning to recognize their responsibilities and are rethinking business practices, you know, how, how they use their social cachet and so on. So you yeah, see that in the development of things like the B Corp, which is a new model for business that 
you know, takes environmental and human factors into account, not just profit. So, what would you tell people that um, that you want to are just starting this transformation process and they want to be a s sustainable and they want to be um, responsible and for themselves and for this earth? What would you recommend that they do to start at their just beginning? Well, I, mean, I guess I sort of said it already, but I, yeah. I would think that they have to like, um, you know, take a little bit of a step back. I mean, I think that we you know, often emotionally we feel that something is wrong or, or that something is, is missing or, or there was some piece of the puzzle that, that are, that's really crucial that our society doesn't offer us. Um, and then, you know, we have to figure out how we particularly like you know, can fit in to being part of the change. And I think people have to have a little bit of patience with themselves. Like, they're not necessarily going to get the answer in one second. Right. Uh, sometimes you have to try things that don't work out. Yeah, and, you know, somebody, for instance, somebody may have gone through law school and have legal abilities. Like, they might find that instead of, you know, working for a corporation, they would want to protect the rights of you know, the natural world or indigenous people or poor people. Um, somebody who... You know, does landscape architecture might want to help contribute to creating an eco village or training, you know, learning permaculture skills and training others. I and mean, so I can't really, there's not one specific thing. It's really a question of like observing yourself and then thinking about how can I fit into to, to the positive change. Right. How can I contribute? Um, exactly why I'm doing media because that's my background. So, um, do you believe it's possible to really pull together? Uh, a tribe or a family of people that really will change the world or help change how we work with the world with our brains and our minds and our emotions and be in more harmony and really make this a sustainable place that's like heartfelt and feels good to live here with each other and that we're all in this place to help each other. Um, I think ultimately that is totally um possible that we could create a more resilient or regenerative planetary culture. Mm -hmm. I feel the word sustainability, some people like it, I mean, sometimes I like mm -hmm. it, but it also, you know, what is really sustainable, everything is constantly right. changing. But, um, you know, certainly, you know, more resi resilient. Um, and, yeah, and then if we see how meshed together we are by these, you know, internet and digital technologies, like new ideas or practices could actually spread all across the whole planet very, very quickly when people feel there's a need for them. Right. What would you like to see happen in, in the near future? Let's see if I have more full already. Well, we've got this one going on. Um, I'm not sure that's happening yet. What would you like to see um, in the near future happening in the local tribes or in, on the individual level, whichever one you'd like to. Um, when I say tribe, I mean the people that we all are interconnected with, not just indigenous tribes, I mean all the people of the world that are interconnected in resilience and transformation right now. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I think that a lot of things are really happening. Like I think there is a spreading awareness that we're, you know, the need of a shift from the old paradigm of competition and domination to one of cooperation and collaboration. I think that's becoming really present in, in a lot of people's minds in different areas, whether it's personal relationships, love relationships, or corporate structures, or, or so on. Um, and I think you know, that could easily lead to people breaking through kind of the inertia of old structures and, and bringing about change in a, in a much more rapid pace than we can even necessarily um, anticipate. Do you believe that we really need to have some applications or herbs or, you know, ayahuasca, for instance, has really, is really breakthrough for a lot of people's emotional and physical and how they use the constructs of our world. 
Um, do you think people really need these things, or can we just create software applications or just hum in our minds and be together on this? Um. Well, I mean, I guess I wouldn't really frame it like that. I mean, I would think that, you know, the fact that these visionary plant sacraments exist on the planet and that they have such a transformative impact on people changing their worldview and their relationship to their bodies and the planet and their psychology, you know, suggests that they're, you know, that they have a, a reason and a purpose. So I, I also don't you know, necessarily think that everybody needs to take them. But I, I do see that um, they have a very positive impact, I, I believe, on a lot of people's uh, way of life. Right. Um. How would you like to see some cooperation happening right now? Well, we've been kind of modeling that through the nonprofit initiative I started called Revolver.net. And I think what we really need is like a lot of uh, creative creativity in, in social innovation and kind of willingness to try new models and, and new things. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, we have about 50 local groups, and when, when some of them or actually sort of incubate new projects if they're effective, ultimately those could become available across the whole network. So we've had like in, in Baltimore, our group helps jumpstart a local currency called the B Notes. Um, other groups have been creating like echo villages or, or contributing to kind of old echo village communities that maybe haven't been so robust lately. Um, I think that, you know, permaculture is a really great model that actually you know, look, looking at what already exists and, and, and building on that, you know, is probably sometimes the faster way to do things at this point rather than always trying to create a, a new thing. What do you think about technology and software development? We're pretty close to Silicon Valley here, and do you see a future in that assisting people? And do you, yeah, what do you think about that? So I think that technology is a, um, projection or in a sense an aspect or manifestation of consciousness because we're a tool using and tool making species by nature mm -hmm. so when we create a new tool it, it reveals our, us to ourselves in a new way so the, the process of, of iterating and developing new tools is actually very much a process by which consciousness evolves and, and develops um, so I think that's essentially uh, amazing and, and I love that, you know, at the cutting edge of social technology and social media, you know, we've seen the power of communications mediums like Twitter and Facebook to even bring about the growth of, you know, community or local awareness to even the point where there's like insurrections as in the Arab world. And probably the, the next set of those tools would be more like tools for how to collaborate and, you know, construct alternative social infrastructures. So that people don't sort of uh, retract back into these old authoritarian or, uh, you know, hierarchical structures. Um, and then on the, on the negative side, you know, there's I mean, all sorts of negatives. There's each, each level of technology has produced, uh, you know, negative unintended consequences, whether it's plastics, genetically modified organisms. And then also a lot of our technical genius goes into really unhelpful systems like weapon systems, surveillance systems, technologies of destruction. Um, so if we're going to survive as a species, we kind of have to get the root of, of that and, and, and twist it. Um, twist, you know, pull it out by the root. Now, one thought that I've developed, or you know, other people have developed, but also that some of that um, may be kind of uh, caught in our psychology because we haven't really fully reckoned with ourselves um, mm -hmm. on different levels. We haven't brought all of our unconscious material up uh, in different areas, but for maybe particularly in, in areas around love and sexuality. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a book by this guy, Dieter Doom, who founded a community called Tamara. Uh, one of the chapters in the book is uh, High Tech in War, Pro-Magnet in Love. 
to be notes that you know while we've developed this incredibly powerful technology uh, you know to destroy and now it's like drones and so on we haven't somehow used our analytic uh, forebrain consciousness to deal with love and sexuality in, in a more um, straightforward way and so actually he and a number of other people created a community in Portugal called Tamara uh, which I visited a couple of times which is putting forth a model of a uh, non-possessive and sharing based um, kind of uh, community uh, environment where uh, love and sexuality can be uh, lived differently. So that's been a big inspiration for me. Um, it's funny to drift there from technology, but um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, ba basically, yeah, we have to uh, learn to master our technological projections, and to do that we have to get to a deeper level of understanding of our own unconscious processes and projections. And we have to do that pretty quickly because the technology is getting so disturbingly destructive and, and, and so freely available. That would be some mass change. I wonder how that framework would work. That would be pretty interesting. Do you believe that's evolution or do you believe in evolution? Yeah, well, I mean, I mean obviously I have a company called Evolver. I right. think that evolution is the best model for understanding you know what's happening that, that in a sense uh, humanity is um, kind of moving to a place where we begin to self-realize that, that we're actually a, a sort of a, a one level a unified or singular organism that as a whole is in a symbiotic relationship with planetary ecology uh, so and that's very much like the paradigm that happened in our bodies where there was once all these microorganisms competing in the environment and they learn to, to work together and create more you know, stable structures and more complex structures and differentiate these organs and, and develop bodies. So it may be that humanity as a whole is about to self-realize itself as, as, a, as a collective body and from that perspective we would begin to share resources equitably and uh, you know, cooperate. Cool, yeah. Unity consciousness. So, um, wow, what would that look like? What would that feel like? Um, well, I mean, I think we're seeing that, like, um, you know, our, our current system monetized. Like, I, well, I guess it would look like a, a planetary tribe in a way, mm -hmm. but our current system you know, kind of took a lot of relationships that used to be human trust-based relationships and turned them into, into monetary exchanges. So people used to take care of their own kids, now the labor is outsourced, they used to make their own clothes, now they buy clothes, they used to make their own entertainment, tell stories around the fire, now they watch television and play video games. But, you know, we, we could go through a process of consciously realizing that we've gone too far along that trajectory and then use the, the, the tools of social technology and social media to like, reverse engineer. Uh, one example being couchsurfing. I'm actually hanging out, with, staying with the guy who founded couchsurfing this week. And couchsurfing took, you know, people used to go and stay at hostels or hotels, and now they um, can go and make a new friend who's actually a local, introduces them to the local culture, and instead of it being a payment exchange relationship, it's a, it's a friend and a trust relationship. So that, that, I think, could very much become the model for a lot of different types of exchange that people make in the future. How do you think this would happen? Like the, right now, couch surfing, it's three friends of friends, hey, recommendations and things like that? Or No. Um, okay. You look online and you find somebody and you read their profile, you can read what other people have to say about them. And the trust is in there and the, the reading. Yeah, people rate them. each other, so mm -hmm. if somebody like, you know, somebody or whatever, whatever, treated somebody wrong or whatever, you'll read that, you won't want to stay with that person. So I think in, in the future, things that uh, are kind of hidden, you know, will become very transparent, you know, so you'll know, you know, whether somebody is, is, is trustworthy, you'll have kind of like an open, transparent um, platform. So you'll see, you'll know in advance what you're getting yourself into. So that's and, and once again, that would have a, a lot of ramifications, especially in the areas of like sex, love, and intimacy. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the books that just came out recently. What is? Uh, about transparency, or wasn't that? Or about having all information free and out there. And oh yeah, one of the books that we published, mm -hmm. the open, open, what's open source everything manifesto or something. Yeah. Yeah. 
So that's that's that model right there in yeah. that book. That's called open source. I think it's called the open source everything. Okay. Yeah. That sounds pretty cool. Um, wow. So how would the monetary model work in this? Uh, well, we've also done through Evolve, we've done a lot of research and, and, and studying that. We've had a whole bunch of articles. We actually published two books. One is called What Comes After Money. It's a collection of essays by different people thinking around the subject. And the other one is called Sacred Economics by Charles Eisenstein. We also covered it in the documentary I made, 2012 Time for Change, uh, interviewing an economist, Bernard Leotard, who was one of the architects of the Euro. And essentially, a lot of people have understood that there's no reason that we should only have one medium of exchange for exchanging value that's, you know, private, privately controlled by, you know, centralized banking interests for their own purposes, that also has a um, set of belief and behavior programs inscribed within it. Totally. So it makes people, you know, competitive, scared, anxious, because it creates artificial scarcity. So the idea is that you could replace that one, or not even, maybe, maybe even supplant, let's say, that one form of value exchange with a whole series, a bunch of uh, sort of an ecosystem of different tools to exchange value that would have different values uh, and beliefs and behavior patterns inscribed within them. So that could be like um, one idea is a currency that has a negative interest charge called demurrage charge, where it's connected to like, a basket of goods and resources that decline in value over time. Uh, so the more you have of it, uh, the faster you want to share it because you're going to run. It's just going to disappear on you. So rather than hoarding it, you want to you want to sh you know sh share it with people when you have it. Another idea is local credit clearing houses. We can have a number of businesses, service providers, manufacturers get together and agree to issue kind of their own form of credit in the form of zero interest loans to support you know local enterprises, you know positive things like daycare centers or local cafes or restaurants or whatever. Uh, Charles in his book Sacred Economics has a whole other idea around using the commons as a, as, a, as a backer of a new currency. So there's a lot of ideas and the whole idea would be to have a little ecosystem of different ways to exchange value that support different behaviors. Mm -hmm. How would the law work with that? Like if someone wasn't, you know, keeping up with their credit somewhere, it, it would again be the transparency of the, the, this person's um, reputation basically. Yeah, well I also think that probably at a certain point we would, you know, at the moment we're sort of, we've had this inertia of this industrial age and the systems that were necessary to, you know, create this huge engine of capitalist growth, which no longer makes sense because now we're increasingly mechanizing all these forms of production. So there's less and less work for people in the old sense. So either you're going to have people who are exiled into like a no man's land of, of desperation on, the, on, the, on a vast scale, you know, or we're going to say that you know our highest potential as as human as human beings is to elevate the, the lives and, and, and way of life of everybody on the planet. In which case, we'd probably do something like a universal subsidization. You know, so we give people the right to live in their own homes. We give them tools to grow their own food, even instruction. You know, and, and then beyond that, um, you know, the capacity to learn and grow in the. Uh, you know, one thing that's amazing about the internet is it, is it shows you that, you know, information can be entirely free, learning can be, um, you know, universally available for people who want to learn different things. So what do you think will happen or is required to happen for this to begin taking place? Well, so I mean, we already see, you know, at the, at the sort of fringes, things are beginning to happen. I mean. You know, e even like a, I think less and less at the at the sort of at the sort of cutting edge of you know conscious people, there's less and less desire for ownership or possession. So people are sharing zip cars or doing you know office shares or you know or, or whatever it is. Um, so I don't think it's going to be like a violent insurgence. It's more of a kind of design revolution <laughs> where. Um, you know, at, at, you know, and, which doesn't take away from the importance of things like the Occupy movement to raise consciousness uh, of the ridiculous injustice you know, that's built into our present social paradigm. Uh, that, that kind of stuff is still probably going to be necessary, mm -hmm. but rather than an oppositional or divisive model, I think it's more of um, developing tools for collaboration and trust building that rapidly supersede uh, the present uh, social structures. Awesome. 
totally. I can see that and feel that. Um, so what do you think is going to happen for the next 25 years? What's your prophecy? Uh, you know, we're, we're probably going to see some increasing uh, extreme environmental events and industrial accidents that will be are quite tragic. Uh, at the same time, we're going to see the uh, growth of this alternative uh, cooperation and trust-based kind of uh, ecosystem. And I also think that uh, on the cutting edge, people are beginning to recognize and, and reckon with their own psychic capacities. And that's going to become part of a new paradigm and even become almost like a new form of energy that we tap into to affect things like climate change or um, Remote, you know, group healing, collective healing, and so on. When you say psychic capacities, you mean the capacity to use the energies or the vibrations or the thought patterns in our brain to collectively change something, such as our own patterns of thinking or weather patterns? No, not just thinking. I'm talking mm -hmm. about physical and tangible things, like weather mm -hmm. patterns, or they've already done studies on remote healing or the capacity mm -hmm. of a you know, large number of meditators in an area to, to lower the rate of violent crime. You know, so you could, for instance, run like quote unquote experiments or rituals or whatever we want to call them, uh, you know, where you have millions of people around the world, you know, meditating and visualizing positive outcomes or, or uh, transformative, uh, you know, opportunities. So you see um, environmental and industrial accidents and also the growth of our trust based ecosystem and our psychic capabilities. Anything else? Uh, well, I mean, some people think that eventually we'll have uh, extraterrestrial contacts, but uh, when that'll <laughs> right. come, we don't know. Okay, and um, what about the darkness? Because like the whole idea that comes to me when I think about psychic capabilities in a mass level, or even on an individual level, I think about the people who actually don't have good intentions. So what about this darkness, and how, how can we work with this as we grow, you know, expand? as a mass of people together? Um, well, I, I, you know, it's really, you know, there you have a question of whether you think that, you know, it's ultimately a benevolent situation or random or malevolent. Mm -hmm. I, I really, my own experiences tend to support the sense that it's um, ultimately evolution is, you know, kind of positive and moving towards, you know, greater self-knowledge, more kindness, mm -hmm. you know, more complexity, more symbiosis. And so, if that's the case, if that's the evolutionary paradigm, then people who are caught in, you know, you know, hostility, ego, they're going to be kind of outed more and more, and it's just going to become, you know, more and more painfully absurd to see those people carry on in those ways, and, and eventually it'll become like a, uh, almost embarrassing, you know, for, for them and for everybody else. You know, now, you know, how that actually takes place. I don't know, and maybe that we have wars, maybe that people who are clinging to their power and resources will become, you know, extremely violent in their efforts to hold on to what they have, or, or maybe that this supersession is uh, more universal based on, you know, kind of the ideas that something like Rupert Sheldrake talks about in terms of like morphic resonance, the morphogenic field effect that has like a certain threshold of, of species reaches a new skill or understanding, that becomes more and more generally available easier and easier. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, sweet, I have another idea. So, what world will we create together? <laughs> that's basically what I've ask, been asking, but that's your specific question for Evolver Network. You want to build community for the new planetary culture. I, that's a lot of people's ideas coming together, basically, mm. right? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure what your question is. Um, I guess I'm asking the question on your... Oh, okay. Part. What will we create together? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, you know, that, that remains to be seen. I mean, I really like um, this idea that art becomes a basic kind of principle of, of, of the new planetary culture. And we see a lot of things which we don't really recognize at this point uh, as creative endeavors. We're going to see them as, as artistic or aesthetic endeavors or kind of social sculptures, you know. We see that obviously with something like Burning Man, where just by tweaking the rules of engagement and, and the way people interact with each other, you know, you create something uh, 
you know, that actually makes a lot of people happy and, and, and joyful and exuberant just because they're in a different environment with different rules. So, uh, it, it, yeah, maybe that art becomes kind of a functional principle for, for, for the, the new planetary culture. Okay, and what do you think about the future of language? Uh, the future of language. I don't have a great thought about that one now. <laughs> okay. Um, maybe with that sound, that's the end of this. <laughs> All right, and you're dr done drinking. Yeah. Cool. cool. Sweet. That was awesome. Thanks, Daniel. Sure. So